Okay, I'm gonna start checking the alignment of these hammers. I may or may not have to make some changes. You know, things can move. And on a grand piano, the alignment is really critical because when we hit the left pedal, we're shifting over, right? So um, I want it to do the same thing to every note uh -huh. as far as where, how it's hitting three strings. Is it missing a string? Where it's hitting them? Sure. I need that to be consistent if I'm gonna get a good shift voicing. Okay. So that's the main reason. Well, no, that's not the main reason. The main reason why we check the alignment, we want clearance between the parts too, because things can move around. Sure. So I, this might be very hard to see, but I look through here, and in this case, this piano is set definitely to miss the left string when it shifts over, Josh. Okay. And I know you like a little bit less contrast. You'd probably right. like it if I set it to hit. Okay. But. For most people, they don't use soft pedal as much as I do, I don't think. So they probably do want that. Extreme. Well, I'm totally into what you're doing, and I've been trying to get better at it ever since you brought that up a little while ago. Uh huh. <laughs> but on this piano, it's a player piano, it's the Spirio. Oh, okay. And they're setting them this way intentionally. They want, they want to capture a lot of nuance, high contrast musicality in the recording. Yeah. And so the, the instruction is to at least that I received is to make a miss that third string so that there's a definite contrast. Okay, cool. So it does make a different tone. Also, what you know, while we're talking about the pros and cons of hitting or missing, now I don't know if you can see, I'm wiggling this hammer just a little bit back and forth, and I'm wedging the screwdriver into the hammers here, and I can just pivot them around. So I just want them to be this, I'm looking at the left side, and I want the same amount of felt on the left for every hammer. And I'm super picky about this. It's very, it's a very finicky adjustment. Um, usually I end up kind of just going the same direction on these. That one went a little too far. There's, there it's back right where I want it. The, whoever worked on this in the factory did a really good job. And that's what I'm finding. You know, um, Josh, they're producing like 60% of their pianos now are Model B Spirio recorded. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a pricey piano. That's the last number I heard. <laughs> yeah. But like most of their sales right now are these, you know. It's, uh, it's, and honestly, I, I, I think it's cool. You know, player pianos, I've kind of not really turned my head at, but I do like these because you get the best pianist on the best piano. Sure. And then you add that record function and it can become a real learning tool, I think. But I sound like a salesperson right now. No. I, so. And tell us the difference uh, between Spirio and Spirio R and maybe the price difference on that as well. Yeah, price difference, I don't know if I'm gonna hit it right. So I don't know if I wanna venture there exactly. Okay. I'll, I'll, I can maybe give you a real ballpark. So the Spirio, you know, when they first came out with the player piano, it was, uh, it's just a playback only. Sure. Spirio RR meaning record. Okay. They added that record function. They have a sensor rail that goes on top of all the hammers. It senses them without touching them. But um, the system's really slick because it's engineered. They install it in the factory. You know, it's they, sure. they've gotten it right. You know. Yeah. The other thing that's really cool is if you get an aftermarket player piano, a lot of times the pedal levers. Let's see. Can we get down on the? It's not very light under here, but these pedal levers down here, they strip all of those and they'll put in you know, different levers when they do these aftermarket player piano systems. It makes the pedals feel just terrible. Really yeah. <laughs> but on this piano, you have independent levers for the player and the acoustic function. Oh, cool. So okay. it doesn't affect it adversely. Nice. Yeah. So I'm, as a technician, I'm like, yes. <laughs> because that's the one thing that bugs me about a lot of the players. So I'm just gonna carry on. That middle section was really good. Like I said, whoever prepped this piano did a really great job, but. Awesome. Okay, Josh, so I um, finished aligning the hammers. Luckily, we didn't make you sit through all of that. <laughs> no, actually, it was really quick on this piano, because like I said, it was, it was very well prepped. It was pretty consistent. Just a little bit of shifting over. 
Um, I align the hammers with three, well, on the notes with three strings and up to um, miss the left string. The bass section's a different story. I don't know if you care, but just as a point. Yeah. Um, I align it so that it does not miss when you shift over. Okay, cool. So I've been told that that's a good practice. So okay. I just go with that. That's just kind of my routine. It does make it harder to make as big a contrast in the bass section when you shift over as you have in the middle, but apparently it doesn't matter down here musically. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Yeah. but if it ever did, I mean, I could, I could align them differently if I wanted to. But I think typically the designers, the engineers have that built in, that type of alignment built into, in, my, in frame of mind when, okay. they, when they design how the piano should come together. So we got the, I think this is drying a lot more than what it was. I think it's okay. solidified a little bit. Do you want to yeah, do your we'll magic? Give it a try. Oh, it's not going to be magic. And I'll make plenty of excuses for you guys. It's getting late. These Paganini etudes are demanding, but let's try, let's try this terrible little passage from number two. Okay, so like he said, uh, the shift pedal, far left pedal, and a quarter pedal. Now I'm calling it the shift pedal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the unicorda pedal hasn't been broken in with that crustiness, like he was saying, uh, but we'll try that with a little bit of it. Okay, and then maybe just some uh, big parts of Paganini Etude number one. Oh, good heavens, I'm getting tired. but now it's speaking. It, like we said at the beginning, it's easy to bring it, or it's not easy, I have mad respect for what you're doing, but he's so brought it up. Easy. Yeah, he's brought it up, it's easy to bring it back down. He just needles it and he's an amazing uh, voicer of pianos. So you can, as long as the piano, you can get it to speak, you can pull it back, but it's hard to get it to speak more and more and more. Uh, it's easy for a technician to bring it down quickly yeah. I think. Yeah. So is that, is that accurate? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's a me? pretty simple principle to refine it. Yep. Yeah. So we'll do some refining, but as you can see, like as I get into those high registers. That's really speaking nicely. So, sounding good so far. So, which would you rather play an impromptu concert on this as it is now or when it's the way it started because when it started it was refined uh-huh i'd probably pretending pick the pretending that the unicorda position sounded a little better sure i would probably still take the beginning because there's so much nuance with the soft but i would uh because i'm like a very delicate player like i'm playing like a lot of But you I've need also that seen to you sound good. You need to, right? yeah. <laughs> but I also have seen what you've done with my piano, so I don't want either of that. I don't want it now, and I don't want it. How's the <laughs> beginning? I just want this, what we have to be refined. However, having said that, I, I know the leading question you were asking me, and I, I'd much rather play a piano that speaks. Now it's much more effortless. It just needs to take a little bit of the heat off uh, of that lacquer, which is he does beautifully through needling. So that's kind of where it is. Um, it depends on the repertoire I, I'd be playing yeah, as well. I guess, yeah, I guess if you were playing a concerto with orchestra. Yeah, I would absolutely obviously. take this. 
we had like no power. And honestly, it's really fun as we refine this to think of applications. So I remember my piano at home was feeling maybe just a little bit on the bright side, but then I was thinking, okay, it might be a little bright for this room, but how would this feel in a concert hall? And my mindset shifted and I thought, oh, this is actually perfect for a concert hall. And you might think, well, that's a stupid analogy. You want it to sound good in your home, but sometimes that mental shift, like I can hear this. That to me sounds like what you would actually want it to be in a concert hall. And I mean, that, that sounds as loud as a D to me. So um, as we bring this back down a little bit, it'll start to sound like Don't a worry, D again. Don't worry, we'll bring it back down. Yeah, <laughs> so, but it's, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're highlighting the process that this takes. We actually have to go too hot in order to get it to speak and then we can refine it back down. I don't think people think through this. I certainly didn't. No, and you might wonder, well then why not just do the hard press hammers like we were talking about that start harder and come down. I, I, I think you can make both sound really good. Um, I like this approach. Uh -huh. I feel like I have more choices with color and what you can make the piano into in the end, you know? But yeah, because you couldn't lacquer the hammers of a hard press. You without. can, but then you get really hard, yeah. right? And, and sometimes you actually do to even things out, you know, even those, you have to even sections out just the same as this. Sure. Uh, but it's just a lot less. Uh huh. Yeah, and that, that brings up the point of uh, just the New York hammers being a more malleable hammer. You can, because they start so soft, you can kind of grade how hard. I, I should ask this question because I don't know the answer. Uh, can you juice the hammers so much when they're this new that you effectively ruin the hammer? Or would it be pretty hard to do that? It would be pretty hard to do that for me. Okay. <laughs> no, I feel like in general, as long as you have, the technician has the skills of needling and how to bring it down, but it'll have a different flavor to it. It'll always want to push strong. You know, if you bring uh -huh. it way just so hard, it's just got so much punch, you can still soften it, but it's, it's, it'll affect it temporarily. It, it might be temporarily soft and then keep going back harder. Yeah, or just have a different quality. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, just a little bit different quality of sound that maybe you might not, yeah. might not be so, so desirable. To me, this actually sounds exactly like the Fazioli that I played Totentons on. I don't even remember the opening. And then it does those huge things. You can really, it, it's so bright. Um, but the thing I love about New York Steinway hammers is how soft uh, the colors can get even amid being so bright. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going right. to do next. No pressure. Okay. <laughs>